Um, we can present our next guest. Um, our next is Lynn Van, Van der Pitt. Mrs. Lynn is a data manager of the European Ocean, Ocean Biogeographic Information System, EOBIS. She also is a data manager of the World Register of Marine Species, Worms, and Interim Register of Marine and Non-Marine Engineer Army and will bring information about experience of worms in organized marine taxonomic data. Thank you for introduction, Clara, and thank you very much for inviting me to be able to present worms here. It's very much appreciated. So what I will do is I will, as that was the question, talk from the perspective of the World Register of Marine Species being a list of names of marine organisms, but also being international authoritative and as complete as possible. And I'm not doing this on my own, of course. I'm giving this talk on behalf of the full WORMS data management team uh, who are listed there. And I also would like to mention uh, at least one of the logos at the bottom, which is LifeWatch. Within the LifeWatch project, which is an e-science European infrastructure for biodiversity and ecosystem research, I'm also responsible for what they call the species information backbone. Now, LifeWatch um, is a distributed virtual lab, and it is used for several different aspects of biodiversity research. And the species information backbone itself is a major component within this European infrastructure. And its goal is to facilitate standardization of species data and also the virtual integration of the many distributed biodiversity data repositories and operating facilities that exist. And both WORMS and Eurobis and Erming, which was also mentioned, are part of this LifeWatch species information backbone. Now, what I will do in the next 20 to 30 minutes is give some background information on worms, talk about the governance of worms, who is behind worms, um, very specifically the AFIA platform, which is the infrastructure behind worms. Some examples of several portals that we have, including some of the regional partners portals that we host and also um, talk about some guidelines and best practices that we have within AFIA and within WORMS. And then, um, as Donald has also partly done, is how do regional portals link to the bigger picture, which is important. And then also what we have available on regional species databases. So first of all, WORMS, World Register of Marine Species, started in 2004. And it actually started under a European project, and it started there as the European Register of Marine Species, which was basically already a regional list or a regional portal specifically for Europe. And as that went very well within the Marbev project, in 2007, it was decided to further develop what we already had in the European Register, to continue it and to let it grow to a world register, which then became WORMS, the World Register of Marine Species. Now, WORMS itself is not just a name index, but it's expert-based taxonomic database. I'll get back to that later when I talk about the governance. What is important is that WORMS follows international standards, meaning that we follow the different nomenclatural codes that exist. Names that enter the system need to comply with international standards. And if we talk about the main goals of WORMS, there's four major goals that we can identify. So the first one is that we promote consistency and stability of names to make sure that people can retrace names. Through WORMS, we can also serve as a guide to interpret taxonomic literature. If you find a name in the literature and you're not sure, you can look it up in WORMS and see whether, for example, it's still the accepted name or whether that has changed. WORMS also provides access to additional information regarding the taxon or the name that is there. That has a wide range of additional information. I will also get back to that uh, in the next slides. 
And through worms, so through building this World Register of Marine Species, we can also provide an estimate of the number of marine species that are living right now or that we already know of. Worms is permanently hosted at Bliss, which is the Flanders Marine Institute, and we are located in Ostende, which is a city in Belgium in Europe. Permanent host institute, meaning that Bliss has committed to keep worms online for eternity, basically. We will continue to keep worms online and to host the register, so it will not get lost. It's more or less, in that sense, project independent, although there's a lot of project funding linked to it. But the main uh, aim is to keep it online. It's web-based, uh, which means that it has an online interface where people can access it and change it and update it. And we also have a lot of web services available, which means that there's a lot of machine-to-machine -machine possibilities to link with worms, to manage your own data if you have a database or an infrastructure of your own at your institute or within a project. I will also very often mention AFIA. AFIA is the data system or the data infrastructure behind worms. And it's very important. It's not just the database infrastructure, but under that same umbrella, we also talk about the online editing interface that people can use to update information in the system and also the services that we have. Very relevant is that AFIA, so the database structure as a whole, is not limited to marine information. It can also perfectly capture non-marine information and species, which means that the information that we have in AFIA is a combination of marine, freshwater, and terrestrial species. And it's just the way that things are displayed where, they, where we make distinctions between what is marine and non-marine. That will get clear a little bit further in the presentation. Now, first of all, governance. Um, WORMS is a large database and is managed at three different levels. And the first level is the editorial board that we have. And this editorial board is basically the driving force behind the content uh, and the quality of, of WORMS. And right now, there is more or less a little bit over 500 editors that are actively working on worms and the non-marine information. And if we would just look at worms as the marine part, then there's almost 300 editors actively contributing to the content of what we have. As you can see on the map, the map displays the location of our editors and clearly shows that it's global, it's worldwide coverage that we have, which also means because of the time zones, there's more or less 24 hours a day activity. And also we often say 24 seven. So seven days a week, there is someone out there who's adding or updating information to our system. And now the last item there is a very important one. All the input by our editors is based on a voluntary basis. So they, meaning that they contribute on a voluntary basis. There's no, nothing money-wise in return. Um, what they do have in return, of course, is the major usage of worms by several groups of people, and also the fact that they can really help us to build a global register on marine species. Now, the second level in the worms governance is the steering committee. And our steering committee is uh, 12 elected members from within the editorial board. So on a regular basis, we uh, what we do is we organize an election, meaning that the editors can put someone forward from within the editor community that can represent them at the level of the steering committee. And the steering committee is really the liaison between other international projects and initiatives and WORMS itself, making sure that projects and initiatives are aware of WORMS as such and what we do within WORMS, how WORMS can contribute to their goals. And the steering committee also takes care of the day-to-day -day business of WORMS, meaning that they set priorities for future activities that we, that we do or that we aim for. 
and they also help us in settling um, discussion items or if things need to change on the interface or the direction that we go in general, and that's on the level of the steering committee. Also there, members of the steering committee do this on a voluntary basis. What we have in our steering committee is a rotation system. And the rotation system is a three-year system, which basically means that whoever joins the steering committee or gets elected to be part of the steering committee is there for three years. And the period of three years is giving them enough time to get familiar with everything that we do, what we have, put their own ideas and, and visions forward, and then see whether or not those can be implemented. But the three-year rotation system also avoids that members stay on the committee forever so that there is a regular renewal and change in people that are there. And that with new people, sometimes new ideas and new visions come into play within Worms itself. The last level is the data management team. The data management team is located here in your, where I am in Ostende in Belgium. And what we do is we support the editors, we support the users, we take care of the IT development. And we also make sure that uh, we give support to anything that is needed and make sure that things keep running, that the website is online, that the, the services are maintained and that new services are developed when needed. And the data management team at Bliss is funded through project money. Now, Worms Governance, that was what we are. So the steering committee, the editors, and the data management team. But how does it work? So as I mentioned earlier, Worms is a dynamic system. We have the 24-7 activity. And we have one central contact point, uh, which is an email address, quite simple. It's the info at marinespecies.org. This is where both editors and users contact us with questions, with remarks, with problems that they might have. And this info address is only received by the data management team. So as a data management team, we are the in-between between users and editors and the other way around. And this means that we can filter some of the questions, some of the information that comes in. And then we as a data management team can decide whether it needs to be forwarded to the editors for an action or a question, or whether the, we can inform the user already on what needs to be done or what is going on. Now, some of the questions that we get can be a problem with the website, website uh, is not working properly or there's a, there's a flaw, specific questions on statistics, how many marine species, for example, within the fish, I cannot find it online, can you help me? I found a possible spelling issue uh, with one of the species, is this correct or not? And so on and so forth. And also a lot of information coming in on possible missing taxa that we have. I mentioned earlier, we are aiming to be a global marine register, but that does not mean that we are complete. Worms is continuously growing day by day, meaning if a species gets described this year, then it will be added to the system, which is a continuous update. Or if there's any changes in taxonomy on being an accepted name and being a synonym or anything that relates to that, then that information is still being updated into the system. So if there's things that we can solve directly from a user to the info address, we also go back to the user and just give them the necessary information. In some cases, what we will need to do is the things that we cannot solve as a data management team, because the data management team is a combination of scientists and IT people, but we are not taxonomists ourselves. So that means if we get specific questions related to taxonomy, then we do send those forward to the editor. And then once the editor gives us back the information, we are contacting the user with the correct explanation on their question. Why are we the in-between? Just to make sure that our editors are not being overloaded by questions that sometimes can easily be solved on the data management team side. So taking into account that editors are doing this on a voluntary basis, it really helps that we are filtering there the questions that we do and do not send to them. 
every question does get a reply. So it doesn't matter whether we have to send it to the editor or not, a reply will be given. It might just take a few days before we get to the final result of the question. Now, Worms, as I said, is part of the AVIA platform and can capture a lot of information that is related to taxonomy. And this is a very uh, rough schematic of what our database looks like. So taxonomy is the core. We are a taxonomic register, but linked to taxonomy, we also document distribution attributes. Attributes, for example, being um, the functional group. Is it bentos or is it plankton? Is it a parasite? Is it an introduced species? And so on. Those are attributes that we collect, ecological information, basically. And also specimen details. And within the specimen details, we do focus on the holotype and the paratypic information that we put there. So not a full specimen collection of a museum, but really focused on the, the type specimen information. We can also document vernacular names. We already have a lot of different languages available within the system. We can also have identification keys. Uh, some groups within Worms have done that. They already had identification keys available somewhere. And we just make them available through Worms as well. Notes information, meaning that any information that does not fit in any of the above categories can go in a note. A note is a free text field which you can tag as being ecology information or additional taxonomy information. We also have a lot of links in our database and those are links to other systems that are out there. Uh, that can be other taxonomic databases or that can be an ecological resource that is available online. So those are there as well. Images can be uploaded into the database. And we also have a part uh, which we call or refer to as internal database management. And that is basically the part where the data management team makes sure that the correct editing rights are assigned to the correct persons. Now, what we do is we only uh, put into the system published taxonomic names following those international taxonomic standards. And that's very important because Worms is not there to reflect unpublished taxonomic opinions and it will not propose new combinations. So every information part that we have needs to be uh, documented basically. And that is the sources part. Now, before I get to the sources on taxonomy, what is important is that each taxon name in our system has a unique identifier, which we call the LSID, which is a life science identifier. It's unique, it's persistent and stable, and it's location independent. As Donald mentioned, for example, we provide part of Worms to Catalog of Life. And with the provision of the taxonomic names, we also provide that identifier. And when that identifier is stored somewhere else, it gives a very specific and unique link back to Worms. So you can always retrace back to Worms, see where it comes from. Now for sources, so you can see each part of the information that we put into the database needs to be backed up with a source. And this also kind of links back to what Donald was referring to the different principles. If you are creating uh, species registers or databases is the principle of traceability. Documenting the source means that a user can see where the information comes from and if needed, go back to that specific source to look up some more information or if they want to, to verify the information. There's different types of sources that can be there, but the most common one is a scientific publication. So you just document the reference of the publication in the system and you link it to, for example, the name. Very uh, common or what we aim for is to have for each name, the original description linked to it. So that would be the scientific publication. It can also be gray literature um, coming from a guide or something within an area that says this species occurs here and there. So that information as a distribution can be added to the system. And then that source is linked to it. A source can also be a different database. 
or it can also be an expert because we do realize that not all knowledge is documented in a publication. So a database and an expert can also be added. But that is one of the requirements. If you add information to the system, it needs to be backed up with a source. Now, WORMS, as part of the AFIA platform, this schedule shows uh, very roughly what we can do. So all information is stored in the AFIA platform, that upper level. Um, all information is stored in there once. And just based on the information that is there or the specific tags that are linked to the information, we can create three different things. We can, first of all, on the left, create global species databases, which includes worms, which is a global marine species register. But that can also be for specific groups upon the request of the editors that we work with. So we have, for example, a periphera or a sponge global register as well. It can also be uh, a mix of marine and non-marine. Mollusca base is an example of that. So all mollusks, marine, terrestrial, and freshwater are being documented there. And they're basically shown there because of the information that is added in the AFIA platform. The same for, in the center, the regional species databases. So in the AFIA platform, you have a taxon name. And for that taxon, it is documented that it is present, for example, in the North Sea. As the North Sea is part of Europe, then that species will show up in the European Register of Marine Species, which is ERMS on the schedule. We also have an African, a Canadian, an Antarctic register, and so on. There's plenty of examples there. What we have on the right hand side is the possibility to create thematic species uh, databases. And thematic is then mostly linked to the traits that I mentioned earlier, or the at traits or attributes, so ecological information. We have, for example, a register on harmful algal blooms, on introduced species, and on deep sea species. And those are generated based on the information, again, that is in the AFIA platform. Now, this is the theoretical scheme. I'll explain with an actual example that we have. And the example is a sponge. So the name of the sponge, the Holiclona sustellar sena, is documented here on the AFIA infrastructure level. Now, because of the hierarchy of this species name, we know that it's a uh, a sponge, first of all, a sponge, so it will show up in the Porifera global species database, and it will also show in worms because it has here been identified that this is a marine species. Yeah. Next, on this level, we have a distribution that says this species occurs in the North Sea. Just as I mentioned earlier, because we know it's the North Sea and we know the North Sea is part of Europe, this species will show in the European Register of Marine Species. In addition, we also know that this species has been introduced in specific locations. And because of the information on this level, saying that it has been introduced in a specific area, it will also become part of the uh, Register of Introduced Marine Species. Now, key message of this is that everything happens on this level. So the database infrastructure, AFIA, captures all the information, and there's just different interfaces on top of AFIA that show you a World Register of Marine Species, a sponge database, an introduced register, and so on. And that is the key, only documenting your information once. So no duplication of efforts just once. Now, some of the portal examples, so the first one, worms, World Register of Marine Species, the global one, the sponge database, the World Periphera database that I mentioned, um, specifically designed to show and capture all the sponge information that we have, and the introduced register, specifically targeting only introduced marine species. Each portal gives the opportunity to give some background information on the specific portal. So if you would go to the Porifera database, you would find some additional information and news on sponges. 
if you go to the introduced register, it will explain how is introduced defined and what are the means and the purposes behind that specific portal. Now, what we also have is regional portals. So for example, an African register of marine species, again, built on this AFIA database infrastructure and through this interface only displaying the species that have a link with Africa. The same for a Belgian register that we have and also a Hong Kong register. These are just a few examples of what we have, what we manage. Now, if we look at regional portals, I showed that we already have a few. And if we work with regional portals, there's a number of guidelines and best practices within AFIA that can be taken into account. Now, first of all, a regional portal starts with a question. Regional portal can actually be a region or it can be a nation or it can be a part within a nation or a country. So you can kind of look at regional and very broad meaning. It all starts with a question. And the question is mostly which species are specific to my country or my region. And then there's two things. The first thing can be, okay, I would like to create a regional portal, but nothing digitally exists. So you actually have to start from a paper-based source or you have to start from expert knowledge to build your list. The others, okay, two examples of that. So from, from a paper-based and expert knowledge started is, uh, for example, the European Register of Marine Species. And we also have a register for the uh, islands of the Azores. Both of them started from a paper-based source. The second one is, okay, we do have some digital sources available. That can be very basic, a word, a text, or a PDF, but it's digital, or there can be Excel files or a database already that exists that captures your regional species information. Now, in most cases, it's a combination of both. And by that combination comes that you have to take into account a number of things and it comes down to exploring, compromising, synchronizing, and joining. So if people come to us saying that they would like to have a regional portal, there's a number of questions that we ask and a number of suggestions that we put forward. And the first one will always be to check for ongoing initiatives, similar initiatives, initiatives in parallel. Because if you join forces, you're a lot stronger than you do things on your own. And also linking back to what Donald said, you avoid duplication of efforts. Once you have done that, once you have identified possible collaborators, possible other initiatives that can support you or that have similar goals, then you can start forming an alliance or a network or just a collaboration. And that will involve three levels or three different groups that will involve experts, editors, and data managers. And from there on, what you do is you decide where, who, and how you will manage and maintain that regional register. So is it something that will be done local? Is it something where you will go to an existing initiative and just see whether they can help you to capture your, um, your list, your data system, the portal that you would like to build? And then you'll also uh, start talking about data formats and templates. How are you going to feed the information into that portal, into that regional list? Uh, second thing is how detailed are you going to go? By which I mean you can have a regional list, which is basically just the list of species. Or you can go in more detail saying, OK, for each species, I want to define which specific part of the region it's part of. Because if you're looking at a specific region, there might be a difference between the north and the south, the east and the west, or the coastal and the inland areas, for example. So those are things that you need to think about. How much detail are we going to capture? If you work with a group of people, what is important is that you make sure that the whole group is aware of what is going on, what will happen, and what can be done. And then you also, of course, want to do a certain outreach to the user. So meaning that you will organize probably a training for the people that are going to be behind the register. So the people that are going to do the inputs and going to make sure that the register becomes 
effect and that it will be continued and that they know very well the, the possibilities and the, the do's and don'ts of fulfilling such a register. And then very important, the last one is to also think about continuation. Because what we see is that a lot of registers start within a project. And then mostly when the project ends, the work on the register ends. And in a lot of cases, that's a shame because the information there is, is very valuable, is very useful for not just the group that works on it, but for a very wide audience, be it scientists or be it the general public that wants to know more about species in a specific region. So it's very important that from the very start of developing a regional list and a regional portal is to consider how it will be continued, how you can define and ensure that there's continuation if it would be within a project after the end of the project. So it's definitely something to, uh, to consider, to think about. Now, if we just take this from the AFIA perspective, the worms perspective, um, this is how it would work for us. So on the editor level, so being editors being defined as the people that have input into the register, is that there will be a collaboration between taxonomic and thematic editors or experts. I'm kind of using editors and experts in the same meaning here. And the distinction is that a taxonomic editor is um, an editor, a taxonomist, that has editing rights on all levels of the AFIA infrastructure, meaning that they can add taxonomy information, distributions, specimens, images, and so on and so on. They have the taxonomic knowledge of a specific group that they're working on, and a taxonomic editor is also or has, has limits within what they do in a sense that a mollusk expert will not work on fish and the other way around. So taxonomic editor is really seen within a specific taxonomic group within all species hierarchies. Next to that, what we have is thematic or a regional editor. They also have editing rights on all levels within the infrastructure, except on taxonomy because these are the people that have really good and expert knowledge on more the ecological side of the species. Where does it occur? Where does it not occur? Um, if you go into traits and attributes, the specifics of the ecological information. So they also add information, just not on the taxonomy level. And there's a very good collaboration between both levels. So taxonomic editors collaborate with thematic and regional editors and the other way around. Now on the steering committee level, if we're looking at governance, how does that work? A regional portal that has all or some marine taxa in it also falls under the general steering committee which means that if decisions are being taken in general on AFIA or on worms, that those decisions also count for the regional portal. What is also an option, and some of our portals or groups do that, is to have a regional register steering committee. There is, for example, a small steering committee for the introduced species and also for the African register, just to name two. Those specific steering committees on the regional level um, have the day-to-day -day knowledge and uh, information for that specific register, for that region. So how do they outreach and communicate on their register is in their hands. That is not done on the level of the general worms steering committee. What does it do on the data management team level? Um, what we do is we do just as we do for worms in general, as we do for AFIA as a whole, we provide support on different levels. We explain the how to, so how to enter your information, how to start working on a regional list, how to uh, make sure that there's a good communication between the regional and the taxonomic level or the regional and the global level and so on. What we can also do is set up your portal. You provide us with the information that you want on the portal, a general introduction, and then we make sure that that gets online. And just as I explained on the level of worms, 
Also on the regional and the thematic level, we are the in-between between the user and the editor. So remember that schedule where the data management team is central between user questions and us filtering whether the question needs to go to an editor or whether the data management team can already help with what needs to be done. And what is important, of course, is that clear agreements are made with the data management team, and that is specifically on what can and cannot be done and which time span we're looking at. Because we do get a lot of requests, either for regional portals, for thematic portals, for adding specific information to our uh, AFIA database infrastructure that we really need to plan ahead and see what can be done within which time frame. We try to accommodate as, as much of the questions as we get, but it does mean that some of the questions are pushed back a little bit because we just need time. Now, regional portal as part of the bigger picture, and I'll just focus on the information that I received is that we are currently talking about a Latin America and Caribbean region species register. And this is purely hypothetically speaking from the point of view of aphia and worms. So this LAC, this um, Latin American and Caribbean region species register would become part of the, could become part of the aphia platform in which it is one of those regional species databases. Remember the distinction that I showed on the AFIA platform level, so regional, thematic, and global. So since this is for a specific region, it would be a regional species register. And it can contain everything, terrestrial, fresh, brackish, marine, and also fossil and recent taxa in there. Now, if we uh, look back a little bit and just take it as a whole, what will happen is that we also have the global species databases within that platform. So all information that would be available within this regional register, which is brackish and marine, and which is about recent species, will also become part of the World Register of Marine Species without you having to do anything extra. It's just because it is being flagged as marine that it becomes part of worms, no extra actions needed. Now this is within the AFIA platform. What also happens is that the AFIA platform has a lot of connections outside of AFIA and outside of bliss of our institute. So if you look at the bottom left, there's, for example, a lot of systems, projects, and people that are using the content of AFIA as a quality control tool. For example, OBIS, the Ocean Biodiversity Information System on a global level. Also, GBIF receives a copy of our taxonomy, so they also make use of that. There's many institutes, many organizations, initiatives that use the content of AFIA to make sure that the taxon names that they are dealing with are in synchronization with the information that we have in AFIA. Um, also individual researchers, eh? someone working on a PhD or a thesis is making use of the content of the AFIA platform to make sure that they um, have a double check, for example, on the taxonomy that they use and on the relationship between species. Now in the center, there's also systems that are providing data to AFIA. And this is mostly what we refer to as the externally hosted and managed species databases. And this basically comes back to the point that I already mentioned a few times that we try to avoid duplication of efforts. Um, I think maybe most of you would be familiar with FishBase and AlgaeBase and also the, the International Virus Association. The, there's also a fungi system. So what we know is that those systems are outside of AFIA, are already mentioned by taxonomists and experts that have the knowledge, that have the information. So what we do is we don't duplicate what they have, but we make a link with them, making an agreement that the taxonomic information that they have, for example, within FishBase, can also be displayed through the AFIA platform. And that allows us to still uh, create a global register of marine species including the fish, without having to set up a taxonomic network ourselves of people that work on fish, because we have that through fish base. 
So we avoid duplication of effort and we strengthen collaboration with already existing initiatives. On the right, what you see is that there's also systems that receive data from AFIA. So they just basically get a copy of AFIA content, worms mostly, either a full copy or a partial copy. And that includes, for example, Catalog of Life and Encyclopedia of Life. So they make use of the information that we have and then they spread it through their own systems and networks. So as you see, a regional portal, be it within AFIA or within a different um, initiative, a different database system, it, it doesn't really matter, but a regional portal, no matter how big or small it is, is always part of a bigger picture. And it's very important that the link to that bigger picture is made because it gives extra visibility, extra recognition to your regional level endeavor. And that is, I think, important for everyone. Now, um, if you would go to the WORMS website, which is basically marinespecies.org, and in the top menu, you would go to subregisters, you can click on regional species databases and you get an overview of what we already have available. There's a little distinction. If it has a green button next to it, that means that it has a separate portal. So you have a different interface to look at the information although you have to remember that the background is still the AFIA database infrastructure. There's also a few of them that do not have that green button. That means that the list itself is within WORMS. So no separate interface, but still the information is there and is consultable through the website. Now, okay, that takes me to the end. That was quicker than I thought. Um, I'd just like to thank you again for the opportunity to present this. This is just one way of looking at it. As I said, and I specifically stressed that this from the worms and the AFIA perspective, that by no means means that that is the only perspective as Donald has already given a lot, a lot of options, a lot of opportunities that can also be looked at through catalog of life. I think um, what is important that I, I want to give you as information is that AFIA and WORMS are open to requests to host and manage regional uh, species lists, or regional databases, regional portals. It's just a matter of um, informing us on that, just talking to us and then seeing what the opportunities would be. If we see that it would be too much or too hard for us to actually do it, we are more than happy to just point you to any of the other systems that can do it because WORMS has a very close collaboration with Catalog of Life. We're very much aware of what Catalog of Life is doing with its checklist bank and that really is a good system, also has great opportunities to work on. Um, this is my last slide though. So you have the website link there. Um, I know I haven't shown any of the interface, any of the, the content and the possibilities that our interface has. But I would very much like to invite you to just go to the website, have a look at it, explore it. And if you would have any questions, only one address that you have to remember, and that's the info at marinespecies.org. And if you want to follow us on Twitter, there's a handle where you can find us. And um, working on a taxonomic uh, data system uh, a few years ago, I came across this quote and I really like it. Because it's true, it's it's a science, it's an art, and it's a battleground is sometimes hard, but it's a it's a level of compromising. There's always going to be collaboration between taxonomists and ecologists, taxonomists, ecologists, and the wider audience to to come to common grounds and to find solutions. And from the worms perspective, to be able to continue to build on on what we do, because we do realize by no means we're already complete. We're just aiming to be as complete as we can and as dynamic as we can. Thank you. And thank you so much, Lynn, for the presentation. Does anybody have any questions in YouTube or here in Zoom? Diana, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lynn, for your presentation. Uh, it is really, really clear, but I would like to ask um, for, um, for an expert user, 
which could be the easiest way to, to contribute to worms if he, he or she is not familiarized using databases or, or, or just sending an email or, or a comment or, or if, he, if he has a, a good amount of information, how could be the best way and easiest way probably to contribute? Thank you. Easiest way would be to just send us an email and explain what kind of information is available and that person would like to share with worms or any of the sub-registers and then we will see what the possibilities are um, the level of of knowledge on on databases is very wide within our network so we have editors for example that are used to just sending us an Excel list of new taxa that need to be added. We do that for them, we upload it. And some of our other editors are really just playing with the online interface. They log into the interface and they make changes and additions themselves. Some editors like that, some editors don't. We just try to find an in-between way to make sure that any contribution can make it to worms. Um, in some cases, what we do is consult with the relevant taxonomic or thematic editors and just check with them. Is it okay if this goes to worms coming from this or that person? But then mostly that's, that's not a problem. So information can be added, several ways to do it. But the first step um, can be just to contact us on the info address and explain what the information is that is available and how that person would see it contributing to worms. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Diane and Lynn. Uh, we have maybe another question, Camila. Hi, Lynn, thank hand. you for your presentation. Uh, Lynn, I have a question about the APA because we we use it for for uh, taxonomic validations, especially for publishing to through Ovis. But sometimes the the request time is not appropriate. So maybe do you have like a best practices manual for for using the APA? Um, <laughs> that's a tough one because sometimes too ma too many requests are being made within seconds or minutes which means that we have to stop it or slow it down just to make sure that the service doesn't go down, break. And if you experience problems with that, you can also just contact us through the info. And then it's best that you specify from which computer or instance you are using our web services. And then our IT people can make sure that you don't get blocked or that they can give you the necessary information to either spread out your requests or to do it a different way. Okay, thank yeah, we, maybe we use sometimes five seconds or zero seconds. So I, I, I think maybe we were not using it uh, the right way. <laughs> no problem. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Lynn, we have more questions from YouTube. Um, one, the first one is from Sergio Diaz. He said, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, it was very interesting. And he asked, well, how do you become an editor? Uh, um, taxonomic editor, for, I think for the majority of the taxon groups within Worms, we already have one editor or a group of editors. If someone um, indicates that they would like to become an editor, what we mostly do is we for that's one of the questions that we forward to our editors, because there's mostly a chief editor for a group, and they can then look at um, is it still necessary that someone is added, for example, to capture a group that has less activity by an editor or where there's nobody still following up. What the editors will always ask is um, to give some of your own background information. How, what, what is your experience with taxonomy? And then they can see or take it from there. And then mostly the editors contact the requester and then we see how, how that works. It's something that the data management team itself, we don't take decisions on that. That is typically something that is decided by the editors 
And if there would be no editors for a specific group, that is something that goes to our steering committee and then they see how uh, that can be uh, moved forward or answered. I hope that answers the question or at least gives an idea of the, of the process. So thank you so much, Lynn, again.